Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. What makes forensic science so powerful is that sometimes it's the little things that end up being so big in an investigation. These are the cases that stayed etched in the scientist's memory and documented in their scrapbook. A year after Alan Malloy is charged with theft and possession, he is hired as a part-time maintenance man. A week later, he's found by the safe in the administration office and fired by the head caretaker. Two weeks later, the head caretaker's kid brother, John Mitchell, is working what would have been Malloy's shift, trying to earn extra cash for Christmas. Working alongside him is Wesley Carpenter, who studied urban and regional planning at university before being forced to quit due to financial difficulties. Because of his interest in urban issues, he volunteers at the community center. This is only his second Saturday helping out. a caretaker at the center, arrives for his evening shift. He looks for John and Wesley, but can't find them anywhere. In the executive office, he finds John's coat. the head caretaker, John's older brother, but ends up speaking to his wife. She's positive John is working the afternoon shift. He tells her to hang on and he'll look again. This time, in the boiler room, he finds John. There was so much blood, Eves later testifies that he flipped out. He went into shock and just wanted to get the hell out of there. The police are called to the scene. A purplish fluid from punctured air conditioning drums is oozing onto the floor and mixing with blood. John and Wesley are dead, and they'd been blasted with some kind of a weapon. We pick up the story with the investigating officer. When we first enter, we have this massive amount of blood. We have the uh, purplish liquid on the floor, and I'm not close enough to the bodies at that point to tell that they have been shot. I can see the trauma to the head, and, and from a distance of the doorway, is all this blood from these head wounds? Eventually, we made our way to the bodies and, and obviously up close and we examined the bodies. You can see the gaping wounds on either side of the chest cavity, laterally, left and right. Both of them were shot the same way. Even though it's two in the morning, 
Detective Strathdee calls his favorite firearms expert, Finn Nielsen. He tells Finn he needs some help. When my phone rings at 2 in the morning and everybody's home, then I know it must be the police probably that are calling me about something. We, we get called out uh, relatively routinely. In fact, I made it the practice of having my home number on my business cards because uh, as far as I'm concerned with the job we do, we should be available at any time. Finn works at the Center of Forensic Science, where they have an extensive gun library. Most of these guns have been confiscated in crimes and turned over to the firearms section after the court case. It's particularly useful in no-gun cases, that is, crimes committed with a gun which cannot be found at the scene. There were these, these two dead bodies lying there, and uh, to me, they'd obviously been shot. Uh, one of them, he was lying on his back, and there was damage to the front of his, his sweater. And of course, he was lying in a, in a huge pool of blood, so if he hadn't been shot, he'd been stabbed with something pretty heavy. I thought he'd been shot. And also, of course, I saw the cartridge cases lying on the floor, which, don't ask me why, but they hadn't been picked up and taken with them, which was okay with me. When it comes to cartridges or bullets, Finn has a photographic memory. He can tell immediately the 300 gauge cartridge at the scene is for a rifle. But it's such a common cartridge, it could have come from any number of rifles. But after 25 years as a firearms expert, Finn Nielsen gets a flash of forensic intuition. He picks up a piece of wood. It means nothing to the IDENT unit. It means nothing to the investigating officer. In fact, no one would have even bothered to collect it. But Finn senses it's important, though he just can't figure out why. An unassuming splinter of wood. Exhibit A, the difference between someone getting away scot-free or being convicted of murder. Though it was well past three in the morning, Finn told investigators to meet him back at the Center of Forensic Science. The little light went on, you know, it's in your, in your head, and I said to the detectives, I said, I think I know what kind of gun you're looking for. So um, they said, really? You know, expressions of disbelief and so on, but uh, I was pretty sure I knew what it was. That's what it looks like. Just your average uh, normal hunting rifle. And the dimensions of it and everything else, it, it just uh, yelled Savage 99 at me. That was a crucial piece because uh, the investigation then went to, are there any 300 Savage caliber rifles stolen in this area? Well, within the preceding week, there had been one reported to the Metropolitan Toronto Police, and it was within six blocks of the community center where the break-in had occurred. The 300 Savage rifle was one of three weapons that were stolen from the house. So the investigation at that point turned to let's solve the break-in. Because young criminals are proud of themselves when they steal guns, they brag about it to their friends. That's how detectives got to the thief. Police put Terry King under surveillance. King, as police later learn, comes from a notorious family who took great pride in who committed the most brutal criminal act. Terry King's father had been convicted of manslaughter. In another murder, Terry King's uncle had been convicted of manslaughter. And a first cousin was convicted of killing a policeman's son. Terry King himself had been convicted of armed robbery, jailed and prohibited from possessing a firearm for five years. Police decided to swoop down and pick up Terry King and Alan Malloy. The pair are questioned separately. When Terry King is confronted with what the police already know, he promises to lead them to the rifle if he is allowed to talk to his girlfriend first. He is told they can speak privately, but that police will be watching. They chat and chat and chat. And 
all of a sudden, she steps back from him, and she starts laughing. They complete their conversation. Uh, she comes out, take her to another room, and I said, could you tell me what caused the laughter? And her response to me was that he asked her, would she wait 25 years for him? And that's when she stood back and laughed. In crimes committed by partners, it's common if the partners get caught to see them suddenly turn on each other. You know, no honor among thieves. That's what happened here. According to Alan Malloy, ever since he'd been fired at the community center, he'd been itching to get back. The plan was to tape a side door open and stash the tools so that he and Terry King could sneak back in later that afternoon. They smoked a joint in the stairwell, then headed for the safe. John instantly recognized Malloy and knew that he had been fired from the center and why. Wesley told the pair they weren't supposed to be there. According to Malloy, he didn't know about the gun and was scared about what King planned to do. King told him that he was just going to tie them up. Malloy said, let's get out of here. And King said, F off. Then King marched them down to the boiler room. According to Malloy, he never went into the boiler room. to take off, but he didn't. He was scared of King. So we went upstairs and watched King try to break into the safe. According to Terry King, yeah, they'd had robbery on their minds. They'd gone there in the afternoon. They'd smoked a joint. But it was Malloy who tried to break into the safe. He'd gotten scared when John recognized Malloy. Then together, they took the two caretakers downstairs. In King's version, Malloy didn't wait outside the boiler room at all. When Wesley tried to get the gun away from Malloy, he panicked. Wesley tried to hide behind the boiler. King promised him if he came out, he wouldn't hurt him. According to King, Malloy heard heavy breathing coming from John and started to jump on the victim's head. According to King, Malloy was anxious to go back upstairs. After about 10 minutes, they left and headed to King's girlfriend's place. Two different tales. Meanwhile, Finn Nielsen uses the comparison microscope to match the cartridges from the murder weapon to the rifle recovered from Terry King. Intuition is one thing, proof is another. They match. Sure enough, the Savage 99 is the murder weapon. But whose finger 
had been on the trigger. With no eyewitness and the court date rapidly approaching, another branch of forensics now comes into play. After police arrested King and Malloy, they also got a search warrant to seize the clothes they had been wearing on the day of the murder. The clothes are sent to the biology lab at the Center of Forensic Science to check for blood from the crime scene. These days, DNA profiling is the criminal investigative technique of the century. But this case predated DNA. At the time of the crime, the blood classification system in use was called ABO. Red blood cells contain antigens, substances responsible for the production of antibodies to combat infection and disease in the body. The presence or absence of two of these antigens, which are called A and B, give us our four distinct human blood groups, A, B, O, and AB. Each human being belongs to one of these groups. In the United States and Canada, for example, the percentages are approximately A, 40%, B, 10%, O, 45%, AB, 5%. So, for instance, if a murder victim has type O blood and a suspect type A, and traces of O are found on the suspect's clothing, it can go a long way to linking the suspect to murder. Everyone is also divided into two groups, RH positive and RH negative. By factoring in these and other blood features, the accuracy of a suspect being guilty are on the order of 3,000 to 1, meager compared with DNA profiling, where the figures can be a billion to 1, but still enough to convict. And the unknown stains that we, we found on clothing from Mr. Malloy and Mr. King, we subjected those to typing analyses and we established whether there was a connection, if you like, between what was present on their clothing and the reference samples from the, from the victims. At the time of trial, I testified that the blood on Mr. King's shirt was consistent with having originated from the victims, all right, based on the ABO type and the GM type that I obtained. Keith Kelder said tests on Malloy's clothing failed to find any blood that could match that of the two murdered men. But how did King get blood on his clothes? And the piece of wood was a piece broken off right in here. Because you see the, the, the stock, it's held up on with a, with a bolt that comes up through the middle when there's a hole drilled in it. And that weakens it a little bit. So if you strike this hide against something, it'll break and shatter. But they'd taken the, the pieces with them and left this little piece there. Uh, lucky for us, really. If you know anything about guns, I mean, this 300 Savage would bring down an elephant. And then the trauma to the head. It didn't happen with one blow. It happened with 20 blows, you know, that idea. And you'd, 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 you'd hear the uh, fracturing of the skull, you'd hear it. You'd hear bones breaking. Expertise is not just about the gun or the bullet, but putting the whole picture together. When Finn finally assembles the butt of the rifle, all the pieces finally fall into place. The jury deliberated for an hour and a half. Their verdict? Malloy was found not guilty, but he was charged with break and enter, an accessory after the fact with murder. He was given nine months. My impression of uh, Malloy's involvement in this matter was uh, a follower and a disciple of Terry King. He, he liked uh, King style, this uh, evil person. Uh, he, he liked that. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily that way, but he liked to follow in the footsteps. King was sentenced with two counts of first degree murder and therefore was given life imprisonment with no chance of parole for 25 years. 
psychopath, devoid of emotion, remorse, nothing. You know, he didn't say these words, but it was, well, they shouldn't have been there. That was the inference. They shouldn't have been there. The object of this botched robbery, the safe, that King and Malloy so desperately wanted to crack and never did, contained only $51. We all lose uh, lovers and friends over the, over the years and family and uh, through routine causes. But when, when you take that loss and that tragedy, it's caused by a Terry King, as you say, an evil person, who has taken the life of your son to get $50. Yeah, it hurts to try and discuss that with a family member and make some sense of it. Awesome. It gave Bob Strathy a lead where well, he didn't have one before because you had two strangers who killed two strangers. And where do you start? You know, nobody dropped the wallet at the scene or anything else helpful like that, so uh, it's pretty tough. Finn Nielsen was like Exhibit A, a splinter in the side of King and Malloy. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real.